morning and welcome back to the lecture series on narrative modern fiction. We are discussing short story in the modern and postmodern era. So I have already discussed Julio Cortazar and a few works by him. Today I would like to very briefly touch upon Blow Up by Cortazar. Cortazar's uh, works are deeply influenced by the elements of the postmodern, the questions uh, and uh, the dilemmas posed by the uh, postmodern condition. Cortazar's uh, narrator and protagonist in Blow Up, Roberto uh, Michael. Roberto Michael creates the narrative voice of uh, the story Blow Up, uh, opening with reflections on modes of narration and narrative voice. Cortazar builds up anxiety in his reader through the initial paragraphs of this story, Blow Up, which establishes the pattern of a non-story, actually a staggering movement, which does not lead to nowhere. He is also using the element of maximalism, uh, maximum or an excess of description, uh, which uh, are extraneous and which do not lead to a point where the plot can move uh, ahead progress in the traditional sense of the term. Uh, the plot is leading to nowhere. The narrator warns the reader of how he may get replaced in between the story. So the, there is a question of the narrator being replaced which eventually happens in the course of narration. Narrator's obsession with the frame grows into a postercized uh, photograph which appears to come to life towards the end of the story. So and the narrator uh, is a photographer, he is the narrator and uh, he is obsessed with the photograph until he becomes part of that frame, uh, he becomes a part of that obsession and the photograph, a uh, posterized photograph appears to come to life towards the end of the story. Just as the photographer in Michael uh, captures the different permutations of events, the narrator of the story is exploring the different ways in which uh, an event could be interpreted, the different permutations that the events could mean or signify. The narrator of the story provides a shift in perspectives that uh, the event might have uh, when the focus of the frame shifts. So with the shift in the focus of the frame, uh, the perspective also changes. In the story we have, especially towards the beginning, we see, you know, recurrent mention of pigeons and clouds in the in towards the initial paragraphs of the story. That is, we refer to pigeons and clouds and uh, so what do they symbolize? What do they stand for? The reader understands after a while that these pigeons and clouds are connective threads within this otherwise disjointed fabric of this text. It is uh, the movement of the clouds and the pigeons that bring Michael, Michael the narrator, Michael who is also the photographer, uh, back from the photograph to the present time zone. Uh, this short story can be considered as an ekphrasis and uh, it discusses the photograph as its central image. When the narrator is ready to shift the frame to focus on the man with the grey hat, the whole story uh, takes a different turn altogether. And we note that blow up is a metadagetic story. There is a moment in the story where the narrator is guilty of making literature and indulging in fabricated on realities. Cortazar succeeds in transferring a part of his guilt into his readers too. So while one initially despises the narrator for his voyeuristic uh, intrusions into other people's lives, uh, the reader also starts exploring for details and indulges in uh, decoding these people, these people that are part of the photograph, especially uh, zeroing down on focusing on an unusual couple, an older woman and a young boy. The first person narration is the dominant mode and uh, the third person narration is embedded within the first person narration. The main setting is uh, Michael's room in uh, Paris where he is looking at the blown up uh, picture, uh, photograph on the wall even as he writes uh, the story of his experience on a 
typewriter. The secondary setting is uh, the park area uh, where Michael took the photograph of this woman and the boy. Uh, Illustrating the postmodern way of being, the story involves an amateur photographer called Michael, uh, who is capturing a moment of an older woman flirting with a young boy. This ordinary acts with people that are generally overlooked uh, uh, become his central concern of the day. The more he looks at the picture, he finds something new in it, and then when he blows up the picture, he enlarges the picture, his obsession uh, also blows up, it grows. His imagination takes him to a scene where he is no longer an onlooker, but within uh, the frame of the photograph. He also belongs within the frame of the photograph. He is looking, uh, so there is this interesting point where he is looking at himself also being a part of the photograph, himself being photographed. He is the photographer and also being photographed. At the same time, he is a part of the larger scene. So the story draws more attention to the act of writing itself rather than the uh, the discrete events. The narrator is conscious about the act of uh, telling the story and his insistence about telling the story overthrows the act of uh, storytelling. Rather than the story happening, the insistence, the desire to tell the story and struggling thereby with the process of narration uh, takes over. So rather than a smooth story, we have the desire, the insistence about telling story uh, taking precedence, taking uh, dominance in, in this entire narrative, uh, dominating the narrative. Uh, the story is suggestive of the afflictions that humans engage with to find out a purpose of uh, existence. So the otherwise absurd existence and uh, the struggle to find a meaning out of it. It points to the absurd nature of the world and the arbitrary relationship between everything around us. How we, uh, we exist, we try to find a meaning uh, in our existence through ascribing a structure, a meaning to the arbitrary uh, happenings around us. Unless we have a form, a structure, a meaning to hold on to uh, our own lives, our own existence also kind of falls apart. So the story criticizes the idea of uh, fabricated reality and faulty observation. Robert Michael uh, very confidently captures what he thinks as uh, the truth uh, through his camera lens. Um, he thinks that he's capturing an old lady who is trying to seduce a young boy. But uh, the blown up uh, scattered pictures at the end dismantles his preoccupation. He is trying to prove the reality. So in this story, we have a focus and emphasis on the modern problem with the emergence of the craze uh, for photography, the craze to be photographed in the contemporary society, to see others and to become visible both. Uh, uh, both of these, uh, you know, desires are symptomatic of uh, the postmodern existence. Uh, people's fascination about being photographed and the photographer's propensity of ownership, having control over everything uh, that is, uh, you know, being captured by his lens and thereby the desire to intrude into people's uh, privacy. All these questions, all uh, these, uh, you know, issues uh, lie at the heart of the story, titled Blow Up by Cortazar. Uh, so after Cortazar, I am going to broach uh, our discussion on George Louis Borges, uh, Borges and his short story, The Garden of Forking Paths. So Borges was born in uh, August 24, 1899 in Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina, and he died in uh, June 14. 1986 in Geneva, Switzerland. He was an Argentine poet, essayist, and short story writer, and his uh, works became classics of the 20th century world literature. Now, uh, The Garden of uh, Forking Paths is a 1941 short story. It is the title story in the collection El Jardin de Senderos Que Se by Furkan, which was republished in its entirety in Fissions uh, or Fictions in 
It was uh, one of the first works by War has to be translated into English by Anthony Busher when it appeared in Ellery Queen's uh, Mystery Magazine in August 1948. Uh, the story's theme may have been inspired by work of uh, philosopher and science fiction author Olaf Stapledon. So, uh, Borges's vision of forking paths inspired numerous new media scholars, in particular within the field of hypertext fictions. Uh, other stories by Borges that express the idea of infinite text, so text within text, like mirror within mirrors, uh, leading to a labyrinthine experience of reading, include the Library of Babel and the Book of Sand. Um, so, hypertext fictions are characterized by the use of hypertext links which act as networked uh, nodes of text uh, which shape a fictional work. They attribute to a non-linear experience of reading. Borges had read a wide range of authors and among the biggest influences uh, on his fiction uh, were uh, authors such as uh, Edgar Allan Poe and G. K. Chesterton. The Garden of Forking Paths is a mystery story and a spy story and it is also a story about the nature of the plot itself. So, it has this uh, element of metafiction right where it it is coming out of the story or coming out of the frame of the story to talk about the story itself the plot itself and it bears the influence of chaos theory and quantum mechanics in a way it prefigures the modern day narrative of computer and video games where multiple paths are possible through gaming now in the Garden of uh, Forking Paths, if you look at the uh, plot line, a Chinese agent or spy named Yu Sun narrates the story which is supposed to be his confession written even as he waits execution for spying the Germans during the First World War. Yu Sun has discovered that the spy ring uh, in which he operates has been infiltrated by the enemy, so he cannot communicate directly with the Germans and has no convention and has no way of getting his uh, information across to them. So, while he is on the run from a man named uh, Richard Madden, Yu travels to the home of a man that he does not know. As he journeys to the home of this man, uh, named Stephen Albert. He notices that this stranger Albert is already expecting him. Uh, he, he reflects upon his grandfather who uh, had withdrawn from public life. So, Yu's grandfather had withdrawn from public life in order to write a novel and construct a labyrinth thereby. So, uh, once he goes inside uh, the house of Albert, which is also his destination and where he is already expected, he sees Albert already expecting him. Albert tells you about Yu's grandfather because Albert is uh, deeply interested in Chinese uh, culture and he has closely studied the life of Yu's grandfather. Uh, Albert tells you that his grandfather's wee pen never managed to finish this novel as he had planned to write. But when he died, he left behind a draft containing all the various possible plot lines and the discarded ideas. So, it was only a half finished draft that he had left before he died. Albert has only read the draft because it was saved for a uh, the, the man's, the author's posterity and then published with a uh, sweep and leaving a note that declared that he leaves the draft for several futures. So, the question of simultaneity, simultaneous meanings, simultaneous possibilities and thereby the labyrinthine experience comes in for the first time. The abandoned novel is referred to as the garden of forking paths. From this clue, Albert realizes that the novel is the labyrinth that Sweepen had sought to construct the novel and the labyrinth were as though the one and the same thing. In a way that echoes quantum theory and uh, the concept of Schrodinger's cat, the characters are dead and alive simultaneously. 
uh, having been killed off uh, in one chapter only to uh, spring up to life uh, and uh, you know start kicking you know almost uh, only to turn up alive and kicking in the next uh, turn of events. So, the idea is to create an infinite possibilities, an infinite narrative containing every narrative possibility. So, uh, a character that is dead at one uh, part of the narration uh, at one turn of the plot uh, comes back alive in the next turn. So, the, guy, the garden of forking paths, uh, the garden of forking paths contains uh, Therefore, two gardens of forking paths, if we may. One is the literal one, the one that is found in the garden of uh, Stephen Albert, and then the figurative uh, garden of forking paths, which uh, Sui Pen's novel is, the novel draft is. Uh, this leads the reader to question if the garden of forking paths is itself a garden of forking paths. The story itself, the story written by uh, uh, Borges is uh, posited as a labyrinth, for, you know, a garden of forking paths. Just as Albert had to negotiate Sweepen's garden of forking paths in the story, Yusun physically navigates Albert's garden of forking paths and the readers are also navigating, uh, walking through uh, exploring Borges's garden of forking paths. So, we see that we have a story within story within story. That is the structure uh, that we are trying to uh, decode. That is a structure that we are trying to, uh, you know, unpack. Uh, when and, and that is typically the experience of reading Borges's uh, short stories. Uh, Sweepen's novel does not uh, so much reject linearity uh, because such a complete rejection would be impossible when moving forward in uh, reading. Uh, when one is physically turning one page uh, at a time, there is a question of moving forward in time too. Uh, however, there is a, a greater desire to build simultaneity and multiple possible outcomes. Uh, within uh, the linear structure. So, the story creates a seemingly infinite wall of mirrors uh, that uh, is a key characteristic of Borges's work. So, uh, one can see images simultaneously in several mirrors. So, it is very difficult after a point to see which is the original and which is the reflection and then we have reflections of reflections and so forth. The Garden of Forking Past is one of the first instances of uh, literature reflecting the notion of multiple possible futures and uh, general uh, timelines uh, connected by events serving as nodes where timelines both converge and diverge. This uh, refers to the labyrinthine structure underlying Sweepen's novel which is greatly reminiscent of the structure of uh, Herbert Quinn's April March. So, the concept of time as a labyrinth through which Yusun uh, finds himself led to his ultimate fate is remarkably in line with some modern quantum mechanical ideas about the structure of reality and potential alternate realities. So, regarding the structure of the story itself, the readers note that the account of Yusun uh, begins in media res and that the story following its conclusion is uh, unreal and insignificant. So, the story following its conclusion, presumably after uh, Yusun's uh, execution, uh, appears to be unreal and insignificant. Uh, an anonymous writer introduces a document that will supposedly shed some light on why a British offensive against the Germans had to be delayed. The document is in the form of an oral testimony given by a witness, Dr. Yu Sun, uh, which is to be used in a trial. The first two pages are missing, so the narration begins abruptly in media's race, like I said. Uh, in this way, Borges has essentially trimmed the narrative to the time uh, in between two nodes, 
the labyrinthine path of choices uh, down which Yusun has led in the precise uh, portion of the narrative is what uh, leads to the delay in the uh, allied assault. So, the story is effectively a microcosm of the theory uh, that is posited by Dr. Stephen Albert, a character within the story. It has a lot of metafictional elements. So, one of the characters, Stephen Albert, uh, posits a, a, a theory which is also applied in the reading of both uh, the novel by Sweepin and uh, Borges' uh, short story, The Garden of Forking Paths. So, labyrinths show up repeatedly in Borges' works, particularly in The Garden of Forking Path. These labyrinths are not always literal in their meaning. Uh, so, for example, a survey of the works of Herbert Quain in this work, a survey of the works of Herbert Quain, the labyrinthine nature of the god of the labyrinth appears to come more from the structure of the book's uh, false ending than the actual substance of the plot. Right? In a, a survey of the works of Herbert Quain, the labyrinthine nature of the god of the labyrinth appears more from the structure of the book's uh, false ending than from the actual substance of the plot. The labyrinth as a symbol is ideal for tackling concepts of free will and fate, which uh, Borges is very fond of treating and these are some of the questions keep coming back, they keep coming back in Borges' works. Uh, from within a labyrinth, it is virtually impossible to conceive what the entire maze is structured like, what is overall structure of the maze. One can take many different paths which lead to the same place, even if uh, there are uh, a number of dead ends too. Uh, so, when, exi when one exits a labyrinth, it is also unclear if uh, this is the only way to exit it or if there are different paths that lead to different exits. So, these questions, these notions of alternate paths uh, with intersections and potentially, you know, inevitable outcomes enable the reader to mediate on what precisely our ability to choose leads at us to. Are we freer because we are choosers when we have choice in life? Are we exhibiting greater free will through that or uh, if free will and fate are mutually uh, exclusive. So, is free will also incumbent on fate and uh, fate is tied to the question of free will. These are some of the fundamental questions that uh, Borges makes his uh, readers uh, ponder, think. So, Metafiction is one of the elements uh, in the Garden of Forking Paths. In the foreword of the Garden of Forking Paths, Borges says, I quote, it is a laborious madness and an, and an impoverishing one, the madness of composing vast books, setting out in 500 pages an idea that can be perfectly related orally in five minutes. The better way to go about it is to pretend that those books already exist and offer a summary, a commentary on them. Unquote. It is to this end that Borges reviews the invented books which add metafictional qualities in the Garden of Forking Paths, right? It is a commentary on Sweepen's novel within uh, Borges' work. In so doing, Borges is able to powerfully convey the complex themes both in the metafiction and uh, in his review of the metafiction without laboring over the final, uh, without uh, laboring over the finer details uh, that are usually part of a lengthy novel. Uh, the next uh, theme one sees is the infinity. In the library of Babel, the library that is the universe uh, is infinite. In the circular ruins, uh, Infinite is implied, you know, in, in the, the circular ruins it is implied that all men are the actuated dreams of other men. So, we are uh, personified dreams of other people and that is how we are uh, kind of mirror reflections of each other. 
in a similar fashion an infinite number of realities are uh, unfolded and discussed in the garden of working paths borges in keeping with other themes tackles infinity so borges in keeping with his other themes um, tackles infinity as an extension of nature and an extension of oneself much of his literature is committed to contriving uh, circumstances in which the infinite quality of all things uh, is revealed then uh, we also note the magical realist uh, qualities so the qualities of magical realism in borges the style of the garden of forking paths is uh, magical realism uh, magical realism as defined by bruce holland borges is a style in literature that is trying to uh, convey the reality of one or several world views that actually exist or have existed so magical realism is a kind of realism but one different from the realism that most of our culture now experiences it has its own tangential meaning it is a take off from the mundane reality that we are used to experience so borges is engrossing style of magical realism through the maze of clues and circumstances that he weaves into the tale forms a connection between the seemingly unrelated uh, clues and circumstances and uh, you know it is a different concept of time he creates the world of magical realism in the garden of forking path uh, in the garden of forking paths through combining the ordinary with the mysterious borges provides clues to the connection between yuson's present circumstances and the mysterious labyrinth of his ancestor sweepen so for example yuson finds dr stephen albert's house by always turning to the left which is also a common technique in finding the way through a labyrinth the author exposes a new kind of reality through stephen albert's uh, revelation of the meaning of sweepen's labyrinth through the style of magical realism borges tantalizes us with the possibility that reality at least for the artist is an act of imagination right in the case of sweepen's uh, labyrinth the reality is a collection of different futures which is created by man's imagination of the many possible outcomes that can occur uh, through choosing each of the several alternatives the meaning of sweepen's garden of forking paths right the magical realist style of the tale develops into a complex narrative structure the complexity of the plot is mainly rooted in yuson's belief in the direct and immediate connection between the past and the future so we see we can also add an archetypal lens to our reading of the garden of forking paths where uh, we see that the archetype of labyrinth uh, keeps coming back the archetype of quest uh is there in the novel uh it it is uh, persist it persists in uh, uh yusun's uh, journey and uh in the reader's exploration of borges's uh, story metaphorically this forking path is within each one of us we are uh, constantly also discovering ourselves so it's not only a journey on the outer but also a journey on the inner the labyrinth is uh, existent in all of us it is uh, experiencing the labyrinth exposes uh, reveals the transcendental self which manifests uh, all the individual characters at the heart of all of us is this transcendental self so at the end of all the labyrinths what we discover is a self which is uh, common to all which is the reflection which is the image of none other than the god right so uh, uh, yusuf's reflections on the decisions that he makes in the present is meant to foreshadow the future the narrative takes place inside the mind of yusuf right so the labyrinth is uh, on the inner 
the journey is not only happening outside, but there is also a simultaneous journey, the psychic journey. And the garden of forking paths exists inside each one of us. The foreshadowed future evolves and shifts along with each decision that Yusu makes. When at first, uh, when at first he does not have a plan, he imagines that the future holds only his inevitable death. But as he formulates a plan, he becomes convinced of the possible success of his mission to send a message to Germany. So, possibility is never singular, it is always simultaneous and multiple, it is always plural. For every decision that Yusun makes and every action that he takes, uh, he, he evaluates and recognizes its significance in the success of his mission. He imagines that each is a factor in the final outcome. So, the slightest of victories foreshadowed the total victory. In the small, in one small unit of victory lay the kernel of the total victory, according to, in, in the words of Borges. So, uh, part of what makes the story's narrative structure labyrinthine is its inconsistent valuation of time. The main character is in mortal danger, he must flee and he has a daring plan in mind and yet he is constantly digressing into philosophical speculations. After a hurried escape by train, the tone of the narration abruptly changes. Uh, after seven pages of frantic activity, suddenly Yusun, who previously had no time, suddenly uh, finds a lot of time to daydream, to fantasize about, uh, you know, about labyrinths, about uh, fantastic things such as labyrinths. And he discusses theories of time with a sinologist. So, he becomes, uh, tends to become pensive suddenly. And uh, the time as though slows down, Yusun tells uh, readers that his train ride has only gained him 40 minutes. But the change in the tone of the narration or in the spy's state of mind makes all those 40 minutes extend as if time itself had slowed down until the abrupt uh, reappearance of the spy catcher, Richard Madden breaks this uh, state of trance, this uh, state of spell. The reality of the urgency is only created by Yusun when he believes in it. So, unless he is existing in his, uh, you know, immediate uh, material coordinates, if we may, in his real coordinates, uh, he is not in a rush. He, he only responds to his uh, emergent situation when he chooses to uh, uh, locate himself in his uh, material coordinates, in his immediate surroundings. When he is in uh, a, a simultaneous journey on the inner, the time as though slows down. Um, it is when he stops to think that the urgency dissipates and the available time seems to increase. So, emergency exists only when he deems, uh, he considers it to exist, otherwise not. Through this, Borges suggests to the reader that the reality is only a product, it is only a figment of one's mind and imagination, just as the speed of time in the narrative is a product of Yusun's mind. We can uh, we can moderate, we can uh, play with the speed of time. There is no such thing as absolute time. Time is uh, relative. Time is, uh, time can be treated in terms of our uh, inner life, the life that we inwardly live as well as the life that is uh, determined by uh, external factors uh, and how much we respond to those external factors. Uh, so, Borges's central th theme of time is relevant throughout all generations. It is a theme that does not easily become obsolete and it uh, therefore uh, contributes significantly into making of a classic. So, uh, the Guardian of Forking Paths uh, emphasizes the significance of time. Ironically, the story opens with Captain Liddell's remark about the insignificance of time, an opinion that is proven wrong by the significant role that time plays throughout the rest of the story. Uh, 
In the story, Yusuf recognizes the significance of time. He is convinced of the importance of even 40 minutes uh, as he thinks, I quote, the duel had already begun and that I had won the first encounter by frustrating even if for 40 minutes, even if by a stroke of fate, the attack of my adversity, unquote. He reflects that, I quote, everything happens to a man precisely, precisely now. Centuries and centuries and only in the present do things happen, unquote. In this passage, Yusun uh, recognizes the importance of time in the present and the decisions that are made during this time. So the immediacy is uh, also you know, contributing the, the immediate moment uh, uh, shapes meanings. It contributes towards churning out uh, new meanings. Uh, although he firmly believes that a man ought to impose upon himself a future as irrevocable as the past through the decisions that one makes, uh, he also knows that actions in the present now are what really matter. And they ultimately determine the fate of a man, just as his previously made decision to shoot Stephen Albert mattered less than his actual act of shooting him, right? Uh, so, we see uh, there is an imminence that is uh, added to any experience, even to one's existence. So, uh, rehearsing a thing ten times inside one's mind and doing it one time. Uh, there is a difference, there is a huge difference between the two. We are shaped by what we are doing at every moment, right? Uh, it, it, deter, it, it, it makes us who we are. The distinct style of magical realism, the complex narrative structure and the theme of time, all of these uh, factors contribute to making the Garden of Foking Pass uh, a significant piece of literature and a classic tale uh, that transcends all time and space. With this, I am going to stop today's lecture here and we are going to meet with another round of discussions in our on-swing lectures. Thank you.